It was in 1901, a New Year's Day, when what is known today as the classic Pentecostal movement traces back its origin and its birth when Agnes Osman first spoke in tongues in the church and the school of Charles F. Parnum who had a Bible school in Topeka, Kansas. After that uh, New Year's Day 1901 display of what Charles Parnum and Agnes Osmond said was a new display or movement of the Spirit of God in the hearts and the lives of genuine believers, the movement found itself uh, ridiculed as a kind of a... Uh, a sociological, psychological abnormality that was uh, created amongst the poor and the disadvantaged. As the movement continued to grow in its experience, in the 1960s we saw the movement blossom into what has today been called the modern-day charismatic movement. In the 1960s, this gift of speaking in tongues spread uh, throughout the uh, major denominations, and for that matter, both in uh, Protestant denominations as well as in uh, Catholicism. And it took uh, very firm roots in every denomination. In the uh, mid-1970s and 80s, it uh, continued to grow, and we experienced uh, what was declared the third wave of the Spirit, the first wave being the classic Pentecostalism, the second wave being the charismatic movement uh, throughout the denominations, and then the third wave was declared that of John Wimber and his Vineyard Christian Fellowships, which uh, began in uh, California. From... New Year's Day 1901 until today, the gift of tongues as it has uh, developed and spread throughout the denominations has uh, produced, according to uh, church historians, 300 distinct denominations. Uh, the, there's a big seven that uh, most of them come out of. And uh, when I think about that, I think to myself, well, the Spirit of God certainly hasn't united us through this particular gift, has it? If we have seen some 300 different uh, denominations, identifiable denominations, and seven major ones come from it. First wave, Pentecostalism. Second wave, the charismatic movement. The third wave, the vineyard movement and holy laughter and things like that. The church has had to deal with this, and it's uh, dealt with it as it's looked at the scripture, and we kind of divide into two camps, those who are what they call cessationists, who try to argue that the gift of tongues uh, ceased, and usually they try to say that the gift of tongues ceased somewhere after about 100 A.D. or so with the uh, giving and the canon of scripture, when the fact that the gospel according to John, 1st, 2nd, 3rd John, and then his final work, the Revelation or the Apocalypse of John, was written that John closes out what we would call the canon. He closes out what is the revealed uh, will of God through Scripture. Peter says, God has given us everything pertaining to life and godliness. And so some try to argue that with the giving of the canon and the full 27 books of the New Testament, that uh, in the 39 of the Old Testament, that the gift of tongues was no longer necessary, for it was uh, in that group of uh, gifts of revelation, the gift of knowledge, the gift of prophecy, the gift of tongues, and they were all given as an interim communication of revelation from God to the church. Once we had the full uh, corpus of Scripture, then those gifts were no longer needed. And, of course, it has continued to be a source of great uh, controversy and even conflict at times. For myself personally, 
Uh, I uh, am not uh, anti-charismatic or anti-Pentecostal or anti-vineyard. Uh, in fact, uh, we've had the privilege of having first, second, and third waivers in our classes at uh, Heritage College and Seminary. And it's a delight to have folks from that persuasion. They have a fervent love for the Lord. They have a zeal for the Lord. And uh, my experience is, is that when you get them into the scriptures and you teach them some good Bible study methods, that then they begin to wrestle with the existence and the use of this gift in a biblical manner. Now, I mention all of that history because uh, today our passage, which we come to in our study of 1 Corinthians chapter 13, uh, verses 8 through 12, brings us to one of the central passages, maybe the central passage dealing with the question of do gifts cease and has the gift of tongues ceased? Historically, the uh, church has argued that as we look at history, the gift of tongues within the Christian church did cease, at least on any significant uh, level, around 100 A.D. After that, in the early church, there was only one group that continued to uh, say that they practiced this gift. It was a group called the Montanists. And the Montanists, of course, had some uh, very poor doctrine and have been labeled as heretics or cults uh, throughout church history. There have been uh, some historical examples, and in fact, the gift of tongues is not something that is unique to uh, Christianity alone. Uh, Buddhism, Hinduism, Islam, and uh, every major world religion has groups within it that exercise something similar uh, in its uh, phenomenon. But in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verses 8 through 13, we're going to see a transitional statement of the Apostle Paul. And his main argument is that spiritual gifts are temporary. They are all temporary, but love abides and will never fail. And in this uh, passage, we're going to see a transition. He's going to speak about three gifts. He's going to speak about prophecy, knowledge, and tongues. Then he's going to speak about prophecy and knowledge. Then he's going to speak about knowledge, and then he's only going to speak about love. So even within the passage, we have, a, a, in a sense, a falling off of uh, spiritual gifts. Now, it's important uh, for us to uh, understand this because if this is something that God wants us to have, if this is something important for our spiritual life, then we need to promote it. Um, I, I'd be willing to say that if we put up a banner here on the top each week, and on that banner we said, uh, all the people who really desire to know God and walk with Jesus should sit on this side of the aisle or that side of the aisle. And all the people who are just interested in uh, a morning ceremony sit on the other side. Uh, chances are, over a period of time, it probably wouldn't take too long, over a period of time, everybody would be on the one side of wanting to be spiritual and wanting to walk with Jesus and wanting to this and that. Even if they didn't, they wouldn't want to admit it, would they? You know? You, you don't come to church except that you want to enhance your spiritual life. And so if I constantly put that message out there, you know, spiritual people on this side or spiritual people on that side, slowly but surely we'd pack them all in on one side just because of the social pressure of it all. And I think throughout the first, second, and third wave, there's been a lot of social pressure or community pressure. Do you really want to be spiritual? Do you really want everything that God has for you? Do you really want to do God's will? Then you must have this gift. You must exercise this gift. And there's a kind of a community pressure at times to uh, fall into it. They have pamphlets that will teach one how to speak in tongues as if it's something that one learns rather than a gift from God. 
Now, we saw in chapter 12, the Apostle Paul said, are all apostles? The answer was, no. Are all prophets? No. Do all speak in tongues? No. And so it's incorrect to say that the filling of the Spirit is demonstrated first and foremost by the speaking in tongues. In fact, if that's true, then the Apostle Paul really blew it. In Ephesians chapter 5, verse 18, the most extensive passage on defining what the filling of the Spirit is. Be not drunk with wine, but be filled with the Spirit. Speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, making melody in your hearts, giving thanks, so on and so forth, being submissive. Paul, you didn't mention tongues in this most defined passage that speaks about the filling of the Holy Spirit. And it is true and it is accurate to say that in the book of Acts, the filling of the Holy Spirit was followed by the exercise by some of this uh, gift of tongues. But also remember how valuable and significant that was in Acts chapter 15 when the church council meets and is trying to decide, does a Gentile have to become a Jew in order to become a Christian? You know, the dominant... Jewish leaders and Jewish church was saying, well, the Gentiles, they have to become Jews. They've got to follow the law. They've got to follow the way of the old covenant if they're to be Christians. And both Paul and Peter stand up and they testify to this significant thing. And they both say, no, a Gentile doesn't have to become a Jew to become a Christian. And let me tell you why. Because we've seen the Spirit of God come upon these people and he has come upon them in such a supernatural way that both groups have produced the same miraculous phenomenon which included this special gift grace gift of speaking in tongues and that united and common experience is what argued to the church that there is just one body of Christ there is just one family, and that Gentiles don't have to become Jews to become Christians. And that was one of the great values of the gift. As well as we saw, and we will see as we get into chapter 14, the communication of the gospel and the communication of the truth of God's word. So, in 1 Corinthians 13, 8, having spoken so eloquently of uh, love and all of its description, the Apostle Paul says, love never fails. Now, the particular word for failure here can have the idea of it never comes to an end or it will never let you down. And I think both of these are very true. Within this particular context, I think it's probably more the idea, though, of love will never end because that's what he's going to conclude this passage with. Now, abideth faith, hope, love, but the greatest of these is love, and love is eternal. And so love never fails. It will never let us down. It will never come to an end. Love is the greatest attribute amongst the commandments of God. We know that they are fulfilled. Do you want to memorize 613 commandments, or do you want to memorize two? To love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, and to love your neighbor as yourself. Love never comes to an end, and it never fails. And in order to just kind of remind us of this, I'd like to turn to two passages and read them together in the book of Romans. Turn with me, if you will, to Romans chapter 5. And we're going to begin at verse 6. And we're going to begin at the love of God for us, while we were helpless, ungodly sinners and enemies. Romans chapter 5, verses 6 through 11, says this. For while we were still helpless, at the right time Christ died for the ungodly. For one will hardly die for a righteous man, though perhaps for a good man someone would dare even to die. But God demonstrates his own love towards us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ 
died for us. Much more than having now been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from the wrath of God through him. For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son, much more having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. And not only this, but we also exalt in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received the reconciliation. One of the more, most difficult things for people to grasp at times, and people who are, who are not believers yet, is the fact that God forgives everybody of everything except their non-faith or their rejection of him. When, when I have people bring up examples like, you know, Jeffrey Dahmer or Ted Bundy or Tex Watson or other people in history, you know, mass murderers and abusers and so on and so forth, and, and, and they say, do you mean to tell me that after they've done all of this wickedness and all of this evil that God's going to forgive them? And they're offended that God would forgive. But that's the love of God. That's the love of God poured out to each and every one of us. While we were ungodly, while we were helpless, while we were enemies, while we were sinners, God demonstrated his love. What? Love never fails. It never comes to an end. And then, of course, over in Romans chapter 8, beginning at verse 31. Romans chapter 8, beginning at verse 31. What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who is against us? <laughs> Isn't that cool? Isn't that fantastic? If God is for us, who could be against us? I was looking at a little uh, uh, thing here going around on the internet about little things. And it talked about the uh, simple stories um, of 9-11. People in New York at that time. And little things that went wrong. One of them missed a bust. One spilled food on her clothes and had to take time to change. One's car wouldn't start. One went back and had to answer the phone. One had a child that was whining and complaining and they couldn't get ready and leave on time. One just couldn't seem to flag down a taxi. Many, many people who had stories of bad days and bad things and bad events and who wondered what's going on. But in those bad events of that bad day, it kept them from getting to the Twin Towers where they would have been had the bad things not happened. Yes, bad things happen, but bad things in God's will don't happen without good cause. If God is for us, who is against us? And, and, the, and the answer to that is usually only we ourselves if we deny the truth of this verse. If we get things mixed up and feel somehow that God is against us, then we are just 180 degrees facing the wrong way. And that can make for a very frustrating existence. If God is for us, who is against us? Verse 32, he who did not spare his own son, that's God's love, but delivered him over for us all, how will he not also with him the New American Standard says, freely give us all things. The better translation, I think, is freely forgive us all things. Verse 33, who will bring a charge against God's elect? Well, God's the one who justifies. Who is the one who condemns? Christ Jesus is he who died. Yes, rather, who was raised, who was at the right hand of God, who also intercedes for us. Who, who's going to bring anything against us? that's going to stick. God the Father and God the Son sit upon the thrones 
and intercede for us. Verse 35, who will separate us from the love of Christ? Will tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? Just as it is written, for your sake we are being put to death all day long. We were considered as sheep being slaughtered. But in all these things we overcomingly conquer through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life nor angels nor principalities nor things present nor things to come nor powers nor height nor depth nor any other created thing will be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Nothing but refusal of his son and rejection of his offering can separate us from the love of God. Yes, love never fails. And that kind of love secures our salvation. That kind of love secures our life. That kind of love delivers us into the Father's hands. Love never fails, but if there are gifts of prophecy or if there are prophecies, it says they will be done away with. If there are tongues, they will cease. If there is knowledge, it will be done away with. Now, notice that the first and the third of these two gifts, prophecy and knowledge, have an identical statement. They will be done away with. They will be done away with. The gift of tongues says that it will cease. In the Greek language, there are different voices called active, middle, and passive. A passive voice means that some outside agent is going to cause something to cease. And that is what we see in the gift of prophecy and in the gift of knowledge. That there is some outside agent, some outside force that will cause prophecy to come to an end and knowledge to come to an end. But when it speaks about the gift of tongues, it's called the middle voice, which is what we call reflective when you do something on behalf of oneself. Or here, instead of some outside force bringing it to an end, it ceases in and of itself. It comes to an end. I would suggest that this is something like an engine running out of gas. You put the gas in the engine, you let it run, and at a certain point, it just runs out of gas. It ceases to run by itself. And that's what Paul says here. He speaks of these uh, three kind of communication gifts, these three gifts that were particularly prized by the Corinthian people and uh, those that they thought were the highest and the most elevated. And he said, look, prophecy is going to be done away with. Something is going to cause it to stop. Tongues are going to cease in and of themselves. And knowledge will be done away with. Now, again, we want to emphasize uh, that uh, the gift of tongues was the gift of languages. It was to speak in a known language that you had never learned. Then someone would translate that language with that gift, and they would translate that language or that tongue you spoke in, and they had never learned that language. It was a way, I believe, of God communicating to the early church, Revelation, and it had the checks and the balances because no one person by themselves could create the Revelation for one had to speak it and another had to translate it and both of them did not have that knowledge or translation ability of that language on their own. Now verse 9. Now we go down to two gifts. He says, for we know in part and we prophesy in part. The particular word here or phrase ekmerus means uh, to be incomplete or to be partial. And so he says our knowledge and the gift of knowledge is something that is partial. It is incomplete. Now it can be partial, it can be incomplete, and it can still be absolute truth. And we prophesy in part. Verse 10, but when the perfect, the New American Standard translates it, but whenever the perfect comes, the partial or the incomplete 
will be done away with. Now, the discussion uh, in church history and in uh, uh, the church uh, uh, circles has been around, well, what is this perfect thing? What is this teleion, is the Greek word, what does it mean? And, of course, some have said, well, the teleion was the canon of the scriptures, the 27 books of the New Testament plus the 39 of the Old Testament, the 66 books, are the perfect thing. They are the complete thing. And so they have tried to argue from that that uh, tongues were done away with. And what we have today is either a self-induced phenomenon, a false spiritual inducement, or some kind of self-inducement or psychological inducement. And it's possible that the Teleon uh, might be the canon of Scripture. For certainly the canon of Scripture brings us a completion of prophecy, and uh, maybe it brings us a completion of knowledge. Uh, maybe it brings us a completion of truth. But I don't think the Apostle Paul himself knew what this Teleon or this perfect thing was. I don't think he knew when it would happen. He uses uh, what we call a relative adverb that says whenever it happens. It's a kind of, I don't know when it's going to happen, but whenever it does happen, these things will be done away with. Knowledge, knowledge. I think knowledge is that uh, complete understanding of God, the complete understanding of salvation. I think prophecy speaks of the complete revelation of God. And I don't think that the atelion or the complete thing has to be just one individual thing. But maybe there's a completion of knowledge. Maybe there's a completion of prophecy. It's better, though, not to translate this when the perfect comes because the suggestion is as if the perfect comes, then what was the other? Imperfect. And it suggests that there was something wrong with the earlier thing. So it's better translated for we know partially and we prophesy partially, but when the completion or the fullness of knowledge and the fullness of prophecy come, then those things which are in part or partial will be done away with. And that is that outside force. When the full prophecy or the full knowledge comes, then the fullness of that outside force makes the partial unnecessary. Now he transfers into an illustration to help us all understand. In verse 11, he says, When I was a child, I used to speak like a child. And that's really cute for a child, isn't it? Children are very cute. They're very funny. They say the darndest things, don't they? And uh, they are delightful at times. When I was a child, I used to speak like a child. But he says, I used to think like a child. I used to reason like a child. But when I became a man, I did away with childish things. Now, the word to do away with childish things is the same phrase, the same Greek word that was used. 